Hello, everyone. Today we're looking at Hitler's opposition. Uh, we often think that all Germans were willing to go along with Hitler's policies, but today we're going to examine and understand why some people uh, decided to take a significant risk and oppose Hitler. Your starter is to explain what could happen to someone who opposed Hitler. And just remember that sometimes the easy answer isn't always the right one. We need to remember what Hitler learned after the Munich Putsch in terms of following the rules and being able to get into a position of leadership. So please do pause the video now, write down your title, learning objective, and starter. When you feel that you've written the best you can for your starter, resume the video, and we'll take that up together. So our starter, what could happen to someone who opposed Hitler? Now remember, the easy answer isn't always the right one. We need to remember what we learned in the Munich Putsch. Uh, the most popular response we get is, kill them! Uh, but that's not the case. Hitler learned in 1923 that he has to follow the rules. If he tries to overtake the government with a putsch, he's going to go to jail. He knows that he, if he just starts killing people, he's going to get himself into a lot of trouble and he'll lose support from the population. So he needs to be clever. Now, Hitler knew his opposition was a significant danger to him. He knew people like Ernst Röhm, Alfred Rosenberg, he took over the Nazi party while Hitler was in jail, uh, and members of the Reichstag, they all openly disagreed with Hitler's policies. If these people suddenly went missing, people would start to get a bit suspicious about Hitler, and he would then lose support. Hitler knew it's better to have allies than it is to have enemies. And if you start killing your enemies, you'll develop new enemies. So he knew that he needed to get these people on side. So it's better for him to convince them to join him with bribes or with threats. He could provide his opposition with the opportunity to either step down from their positions or to leave the country. Or he could remove his opposition by imprisoning them on false charges. This way, it would appear as though Hitler was simply carrying out the law and putting someone behind bars who was not following the rules. And this would allow him to not only keep support from the population, but to get his opposition on his side. His opposition soon started to realize Hitler's not going anywhere. He's going to remain in power and it's better off if I just join him now and have, you know, have his support and be in his good books than it is for me to continue standing up against him. But the purpose of our lesson today is to find out who stood up against Hitler and why did they decide to do this. So to be able to understand the opposition against Hitler, we need to understand who was on whose side. So leading into the Second World War, we had what we call the Axis, uh, that would be the side of the Nazis, and then we have the Allied, which would be the sides of Britain. So in your books now, just make a note of which countries were on the Axis side and which countries were on the Allied side. So pause the video now, just make a note of those. Uh, when you're ready to go, resume the video. So we'll just go over a little bit of context in terms of German relations. And we have to remember that Hitler was still trying to maintain positive relationships with his political rivals in other countries. And on the right-hand side here, we can actually see a picture of Neville Chamberlain, who was the British Prime Minister at the time, uh, shaking hands with Hitler. And they actually look quite friendly with one another. Uh, Hitler met regularly with other political leaders. We know this was just an act, but he was trying to maintain that level of friendship. Uh, to keep suspicion off of what he was actually doing in terms of rebuilding his military and trying to take land back elsewhere. Neville Chamberlain, a uh, very firm believer in appeasement. He believed that if Hitler's demands were met, he would not continue his quest for dominance. And we know that Hitler was simply lying to these political leaders, saying that he would stop when we know he simply would not. Now that the Nazis agreement with the German National Party had given Hitler control of the Reichstag, he wasted no time in using this to his advantage. The formal name of the new act he introduced was the law to remedy the distress of the people and the nation, but it is more commonly known as the Enabling Act. Brought into being on the 23rd of March, the Enabling Act gave the Chancellor, Hitler, complete control of Germany. Although the office of the president was retained and the Reichstag continued to exist, the provisions of the act allowed the government, dominated by Hitler, to pursue even those policies that went against the Weimar constitution, 
it was the end of the Weimar period. Hitler had to use force and manipulation to get the Reichstag to effectively vote itself out of power. He needed a two-thirds majority in the Reichstag to make a constitutional amendment. The first thing he did was to prevent the 81 communist members of the Reichstag from taking their seats by using the emergency powers from the Reichstag fire decree. He knew that those members would vote against him on principle. Next, the Social Democrats, who were the second largest party in the Reichstag, were threatened and attacked by Hitler's SA as they arrived for the vote. Many simply did not turn up. The atmosphere inside the Reichstag at the time of voting was intimidating. The SA were present everywhere as Hitler began to speak. In an attempt to secure the vote of the Centre Party led by a Catholic priest, Hitler emphasised the importance of Christianity in German culture. With the intimidation by the SA and Hitler's manipulation, all but the Social Democratic Party voted in favour of the enabling act. Hitler gathered 83 of the vote, much more than the two-thirds majority needed. Despite the enabling act formally giving power to the whole government and not just Hitler himself, the Nazis were under no illusion as to what it really meant. As Joseph Goebbels, Nazi Minister for Propaganda, wrote shortly afterwards, the authority of the Führer has now been wholly established. Votes are no longer taken. The Führer decides. All this is going much faster than we had dared to hope. Hindenburg, the president, was in his 80s and played a smaller and smaller role in German politics. The Reichstag, stripped of almost all of its power, met very infrequently from then on and was, in effect, merely a place for Hitler to make grand proclamations and speeches. The experience of the 1920s had shown Hitler that he needed to go through official channels to get into power. By bending and manipulating the political framework created by the Weimar Constitution, Hitler had achieved his aim. In November 1933, new elections were held, but with the Nazis the only political party allowed to stand. However, Hitler never forgot the importance of seeming like he was in legitimate control. The Enabling Act, initially introduced for a period of four years, was renewed in 1937, 1939, and then finally in 1943, for an indefinite amount of time, by order of the Führer. The Third Reich was established. So in terms of opposition, we know that other countries were opposing Hitler, countries like Britain, the USA, France, Canada, uh, but he was also facing some opposition from within the Reichstag itself, as there were several politicians who disagreed with the policies that Hitler was creating. So there's going to be a video which will follow. Uh, please do make some notes as the video plays, and then we'll carry on looking at further means of opposition uh, from outside of the Reichstag. Now that the Reichstag Fire Decree and Enabling Act had given Hitler supreme control of Germany, he needed to destroy all opposition to the new regime. He'd already got rid of the Communist Party before the vote on the Enabling Act. He followed this by banning the Social Democratic Party in June 1933. The policy of destroying or neutralizing all groups and institutions that could put limits upon Nazi power was called Gleichschaltung, better known by the euphemism Coordination. All other political parties except the Nazis were declared illegal by a law cunningly titled The Law Against the New Formation of Parties. It was announced that whoever undertakes to maintain the organization of another political party shall be punished with penal servitude of up to three years or with imprisonment. The next group to be attacked was the trade unions. They attempted to compromise with the Nazi government and so weaken their own position. The trade unions had already agreed that they wouldn't intervene in political questions and had accepted Nazi supervision. However, this was not enough for Hitler. On the 2nd of May 1933, Nazi stormtroopers occupied the offices of trade unions throughout Germany and forcibly dissolved the unions. All workers were now enrolled into the new German Labour Front. Other groups were dealt with by more subtle and underhand means. The Prussian civil service was infiltrated and 30% of its staff were dismissed on the grounds of incompetence. Leaders of these former groups were arrested and imprisoned. Many later died in labour camps. Any organisations or institutions that it was impossible for the Nazis to immediately get rid of 
such as churches and schools, were brought under their direct control. The Ministry for Ecclesiastical Affairs was set up to limit the influence of the church on people's lives. In an attempt to bring people round to their way of thinking, the Nazis also introduced compulsory membership of various newly formed organisations. Boys and girls had to join organisations similar to the Scouts and Girl Guide movement, although obviously with very different aims. By 1936 there were six million young people who counted themselves as members of the Hitler Youth. For adults there was the notorious Strength Through Joy programme with 25 million members by 1939. This programme coordinated leisure pursuits, everything from chess clubs to skiing holidays, and was set up as a tool to promote the advantages of National Socialism to the German people. These organisations meant that the same message was being hammered home both at work and during leisure time. This approach guaranteed Hitler and the Nazi Party mass support. As part of the policy of coordination, the German states were effectively abolished, putting control into the hands of central government. Ironically, given Hitler's efforts to appear as if he worked within the law, this abolition of regional government went against the Enabling Act. Given the power that Hitler and the Nazis now had, however, they experienced little opposition. As the German upper chamber, the Reichsrat, was made up of officials from the German states, it was dissolved. This secured Hitler's ability to pass any law he pleased. So how was Hitler going to manage his opposition? Well, there's a few ways. The first is through trade unions. Now, a union is designed to advocate the rights of workers, make sure that your working conditions are, are fair, your pay is good, you know, you're not being overworked. Uh, but the Nazis will ban all trade unions in 1933. And they also made strikes illegal, meaning people couldn't stand up for themselves or try to improve their working conditions. Uh, and this left people with very little control over where they actually worked. The Nazis would tell you where you worked and how long you would work there for. Anyone who failed to comply with these rules would be sent to a concentration camp for what they called re-education. Political parties in 1933, the law against the formation of parties was passed. This made all other political parties in Germany illegal, and this meant the Nazis were the only party left to vote for. And the last is Lander. Now, Germany has always been divided into government areas or districts that they called Lander. Now, each Lander had its own parliament. And that meant that sometimes these parliaments wouldn't like the rules that Hitler was passing and they wouldn't follow them through to the letter. And this enraged Hitler. So in 1934, he passed a law that overruled all local governments and forced them to follow the policies of the Reichstag without any question. So please do now go ahead, pause the video and make a note of the three ways in which Hitler removed opposition. Right, so we have two tasks now to finish off our lesson. The first is to create a newspaper headline about a German who opposed Hitler. Now we have some examples of actual newspaper headlines. Uh, we have war, German troops invade Poland. We have another one that says uh, Hitler's let's be friends plea to the world. A newspaper headline is short, concise, and it gives us a very clear message. So what might a newspaper headline about a German who opposed Hitler read? So that's your first task to create that headline. Your second task is to imagine that you are the leader of the German Communist Party, so known as the KPD, which is the Communist Party Deutschland. You have just received a letter from Hitler telling you that your political party is now illegal and it must be completely disbanded. You're going to write a return letter explaining what you will do in response. And here's the format you need to follow for your letter. So it will be written on the 13th of July, 1933. You'll address it to Herr Hitler, which is a way of saying, dear Hitler. And it will start off with, I have received your demand that the German Communist Party is to stop all operations. To this I say, and you will continue writing. What is it that you're going to do? You know many people follow the policy of appeasement. You understand that people decided if they keep Hitler happy, their lives will be made easier. But there are also people who opposed Hitler and who were willing to take those risks of possibly being sent to a concentration camp. So what is it that you would do as the leader of the Communist Party? So that's your final task for the day today. So please do finish those off. Be very thoughtful in your approach to what it is you'll do as the leader of the Communist Party. 
uh, and make sure if you have any questions, please do communicate them to your teacher.